And so hope beyond the scope of sufferings. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, Lord, sufferings is a thing that we all go through, God. And many of us, Lord God, we fail in the midst of sufferings, God. Many of us, God, are going through sufferings, God, and we don't know how to go through them, God. We don't know how to see the other side, God, while we're stuck in the middle of a storm. Sufferings, Lord God, yet you have used as a means to purify us, as a means, Lord God, to refine us as gold. We ask that today, God, you will speak clearly to us, God, and that we will receive the hope that goes beyond the scope of suffering, God. We ask, Holy Spirit, for your wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, God, your insight and revelation, that we may get to know you better so that we can know ourselves and then make you known to the world, God, all in Christ Jesus. And, Lord, we thank you and praise you in your name. And everybody says amen and amen. Can we give it up for Jesus Christ? Thank the Lord. Amen. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 through 22 says this. For as a believer, any believers in the house? Give it up if you're a believer. Amen. Hallelujah. For as a believer, you have been called for this purpose. Somebody look to your neighbor and say, you are called to suffer. Look to your other neighbor and ask them, how are you doing during sufferings? The Bible says right here, for as a believer, you have been called for this purpose. What pers- purpose are they talking about, Pastor? When you read uh, 1 Peter in the, in the top verses, they're talking about sufferings. Sufferings. And Peter makes it clear right here. And he says, you have been called for this purpose. Since Christ suffered for you, amen, we did communion today. And we remember the sufferings of Christ on the cross. We remember, and all we had to do was just kind of just close your eyes, or even with your eyes open, just kind of recap the Passion of the Christ movie, which is the closest depiction of Jesus' suffering and all that he went through. Let me let you guys know, just because he was 100% God and 100% man, that didn't feel good. When he got his beard ripped off of his face, he did not just like, oh, that's, just, that's amazing. You know, that, that's just cool, right? When he got whooped with a cat of nine tails and it ripped the skin off of his back and, and off of his side of his ribs that the Bible says you were able to see like through his ribs and things like that, the depiction of it, that did not feel good. It wasn't like, okay, I'm 100% God, so I'm just going to remove pain from my cognition. No, he felt everything. When the thorn, the crown of thorns went into his head and through his skull, how many know he felt that? He felt that. When the spear went through his side and water gushed out, fought by blood, he felt that. Amen? When he was spit on and he was mocked, he emotionally felt that. He suffered. And so since Christ suffered for you, look at what the word says. Leaving you an example so that you may follow in his footsteps. Verse 22. Look at Jesus' thing, though, right? How many people can say this? He committed no sin. Are there any no sinners here? Any no sinners? If you are, please let me know your tricks so I can know what you're doing, right? There was no deceit ever found in his mouth. Anybody without deceit in your mouth? Some of y'all were deceitful today in this rain traffic. Let there be a crash or some kind of truck pulled over on the side and stop traffic. Very deceitful in that one. Baby, go down the runway. Don't, don't, I know I said do not answer. We're answering right now. I talked to the alderman. Don't worry about it. Let's go. And it's like we just do criminal activity. I'm really talking about myself. <laughs> Pray for me, y'all. Uh, Pray for me, okay? And so it says, no, nor was the seed ever found in his mouth. This was the righteous dying for the unrighteous, suffering for the people who deserve to suffer so that we don't have to suffer in this way. It is obvious that we live in a world filled with suffering, pain, and tribulation. Whether you are an unbeliever or a believer, you will suffer in some form, way, or fashion, and it is for this reason we do not come to Christ. Everybody hear me under the sound of my voice. Listen to this statement right here. It is for this reason we do not come to Christ to escape suffering. I want to say that again. For this reason, suffering, right? We do not come to Christ to escape suffering or to have a smooth and easy life absent of suffering because suffering is 
inevitable. Somebody look at your neighbor and says, suffering is inevitable. Look at your other neighbor and let them know, remind them, you are going to suffer. We may not like that, but this is the reality of it. And many people are coming to Christ because they think, because they heard a message that sounded like, you're, you're going you're gonna to be blessed. It's going to be so amazing. Everybody's going to like you. They're all going to clap for you in church now. It's going to be awesome. Watch and see. And then they get saved, right? They do that whole prayer thing, right? They leave the crib. All of a sudden, they get home. Their spouse wants a divorce now. Their kids left the house. One of them strung out on drugs. The other one is just a rebel. And you're like, what happened to the non-suffering life being a Christian? They lied to me. I want to let you know, guys, no, they did lie to you. That was you. But I'm here to tell you the truth. You're going to suffer. Oh, but praise God. That suffering is but for a minute. But the glory of God and the reward of heaven is for eternity. Amen. And so we don't come to Christ. One person receive that. Amen. We're just going to give it up for that one person. But listen, the good news is this, right? I rather suffer with Christ in my side than suffer without Christ. Amen. I rather suffer in this life because we're all going to suffer. But I rather do it as Jesus is my Lord and Savior and go through the sufferings that may feel like hell on earth. But oh, praise God that after I die, I don't have to literally experience hell after death. Amen. I get to go through it with Jesus Christ as the Lord and, 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 uh, and the strength of my, of, my, of my body, of my cognition, of my, uh, my emotions, that he is the strength of my person, that I can get through storms and sufferings victoriously. Amen? And so one thing I know is that fact. Peter makes it clear in a truth claim in 1 Peter 2.21, and it is a fact that just as Christ suffered, we too will suffer. It's not a matter of, uh, of if, it's a matter of when. We will suffer. And he is the example of how we must go through suffering on this side of eternity. And even though he committed no sin and there was no deceit ever found in his mouth, he suffered for us. This is to say that we will suffer even for doing good. So I say, just because you became a Christian, don't mean you're going to stop suffering and everything goes away. You're never going to be tempted. Nothing like that. No, there's going to be there. Some of us, in fact, is praying for deliverance from addiction and from certain things out of our, out of our lives. And we assume that that deliverance comes when we stop being tempted by it. I want to tell you guys that is a lie. True victory is not, and the deliverance is not the absence of temptation. It is, the, it is the temptation that is coming and you being able to go through it without falling into that temptation. That is deliverance. That yesterday I, I might have said yes to weed, but today by the grace of God, God has delivered me and I can say no to weed. Not to say that weed may not tempt me. That's just an example. Don't be going on Facebook saying my, my past is a pothead and we can small smoke weed and then you want to go halves on a blunt. We ain't doing none of that. I'm going to rebuke you, okay? But listen, God is able to deliver us and truly get us through some things. But that doesn't mean we're never going to be tempted by things. Amen? And so here it is. We will go through sufferings. It is one thing to endure the suffering caused by our own hands, our own mouth, our own feet, but it is another thing to suffer because we belong to someone and have technically done nothing wrong other than stand on the truth, live according to the truth, and base our lives upon the truth, and yet suffer for it. How many people know that's a big difference? It's one thing to suffer because I committed a crime. It's another thing to suffer when you don't commit a crime and they got you in jail somewhere because all you're doing is standing on Jesus. Come on. That's a different kind of suffering. It's the kind of suffering we're talking about here. Amen. The Bible says this, Matthew 5, 11 and 12. Blessed are you when you when people insult you, persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is an indication of what we must do and what we're called to do as we're going through sufferings. The Bible says to blessed are you, number one. It's real easy to find ourselves in sufferings and things that were cursed. Trust me, I done been through so many sufferings. And I asked my wife and I would tell her, babe, I feel like I'm cursed. And she got to rebuke me like, babe, just stop that old curse stuff. And I'm like, babe, just watch this. I'm going to put this nail in this wall. I'm going to hang up this curtain. 
Watch what happens. Sure enough, I tr I'm trying to do this in the house, and the whole panel of the window just, just falls off. One little nail of a hole becomes a hole like this that I got to call the carpenter of the church, our brother Theo. be like, Theo, you won't believe what I just did. Well, what happened? I put one nail in a drywall, and all of a sudden, the hammer went through the drywall, and now I have a big old hole. That doesn't mean I'm cursed. It just means that God is definitely trying to try me out here. And probably that too. But your boy is learning, okay? It's not that we're cursed. God is reminding us of his eternal blessings. We go through sufferings and we think it's a cursing, but I want to tell you that God is able to grab those things and bless us. Blessed are you when you are insulted, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Look what he says. Rejoice and be glad. How do I go through suffering just right off the bat, Pastor? How do I do it? I'm going to say rejoice and be glad. What? Pastor, you mind, let me text you again in caps. I am suffering, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. And then I, resp I respond in caps, be glad and rejoice. Never see him again in church. He's just gone. This guy's lost his ever-loving mind. But I want to tell you guys, it says rejoice and be glad. Why is that? Because look at the hope that goes beyond the scope of suffering. Because great is your reward in heaven. If Jesus was persecuted, those before us were persecuted, what's going to happen to us? We will be persecuted. We will go through sufferings. Amen? Now listen to this. While no one goes after suffering, anybody chasing suffering today? I want to go after suffering. I want to please cut my arm off so I can be blessed. It's a little psychotic or whatever, right? Come, we do do counseling for those kind of things. Please talk to me. Nobody goes after suffering, okay? Nobody enjoys suffering, right? I'm not saying playing make-believe right here and make it seem like, oh, dude, I'm blessed, dude. Yes, and you're looking at me like you've been, you have been up like three days. Oh, I'm so blessed. And your eyes are all bloodshot red. You're smelling like alcohol. I'm going through it, though, Pastor. It's so amazing. Stop lying. It does not feel amazing. You're blessed, but it is not amazing. And you may want to talk about that like, alcohol issue you have as well that you can gain through suffering. But listen, it's not to play make-believe. It's to be honest, but it's to recognize and stand on the truth that I am blessed and that I can be glad because I have a hope that goes beyond the scope of suffering. Amen? And so it is for this reason we must learn the hope that goes beyond the scope of suffering and even greater than suffering for suffering's sake, but suffering for his name's sake. Amen? The Bible says in Mark chapter 10, our body of our message here, uh, 32, 34, they were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. And the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the 12 aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the son of man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and hand him over to the Gentiles. Verse 34. Who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him? Flog means beaten. Three days later, hallelujah, he will rise. Amen. Jesus had left, had just explained how to inherit eternal life. You guys remember that, that sermon from last week, right? Very, very heart wrenching, punch you in the chest sermon. When Jesus was asked, how do you inherit eternal life? He answered the question, leave everything. And come follow after me and be my disciples and live as I live. His disciples responded, Jesus, we left everything. And he says, anyone who has left everything, and then he explains what leaving everything is. Who left father, mother, brother, sister, wife, children, fields, meaning some of us got to leave our jobs. Because our jobs do not allow us to serve God as we ought to serve God, right? Not saying go and go start quitting your jobs and all that stuff, but you need to definitely pray about it and have God lead you, right? But who leaves all these other things and who are persecuted for his name and his gospel's sake will inherit eternal life. And then he ended. He said the first will be last and the last will be first. That was the last verse in the last section. That was verse 31. And so he's letting us know what it takes to inherit eternal life. Now, I don't know about you guys, but if I was in the shoes of the disciples, that would make it a real tough for me. In fact, we don't even have to be in the shoes of the disciples. We're just members of this church, and we know it's tough because God is calling us to lay down everything. For some of us, it's tough just to do the basic, 
to pray every day, read every day, come to church every week, right? Be faithful in the very basic things. It's tough. Let's be honest. It's tough, right? And so this is all part of that giving up everything. And see, Jesus in his wisdom, he doesn't just leave us in the wilderness without a way to go. Amen? He then comes through Mark's gospel and begins to speak about the next section, which happens to be his final and third declaration and and prophetic uh, means of his death, burial, and resurrection. And it is through that that I, I truly believe that he was trying to get his disciples to understand how to have a hope that goes beyond the scope of suffering. He was trying to let them know through his actions that spoke louder than words, you're going to suffer. But let me show you how to suffer with hope. Amen. I believe that without a shadow of a doubt. And so here it is. Jesus explained eternal life to them. And now in Mark's gospel, he continues to the next section and he starts explaining and declaring his third for the third time, his final death, burial and resurrection. And so here he is. As Jesus' actions were speaking louder than his words, throughout the book of Mark, we are given a front row seat of how Jesus expressed himself through what he went through by his actions. Amen? The disciples, as Jesus was letting them know about his sufferings and what he was going to, to go through, the disciples began to be astonished. And even some people who followed Jesus, I would say that there were the spectators who followed Jesus they were in fear. And the disciples who were following Jesus, they expressed these things. The disciples were astonished, according to Mark. And those that followed Jesus, they were afraid. I want to say this real fast. Not part of the sermon, but I just want to throw this in here real fast. It's one thing to follow Jesus. That brings about astonishment. But it's another thing to be spectators on the side, never jumping in to be a disciple, never jumping in to re- really follow God. You're kind of like coming and going whatever you please. That is called a spectator. I'm going to tell you what begins to happen with spectators, just like in the games, just like in, you know, in, in uh, uh, hand-to-hand contact, football, whatever it is, sports. Spectators like to look for the side. But what happens to spectators? They become fearful. And see, fear, just like the man of God had pre- uh, this morning in pre-service, fear will keep you away from some stuff. Fear will keep you as a spectator, never jumping into the actual game called salvation and, and working out our salvation with fear and trembling and becoming a disciple. Fear would have you looking on the sidelines like, I ain't going through that suffering. If Jesus is going through that, no, I'm cool. If the pastor going through that stuff, oh, I'm decent. I'm looking at all the disciples at, at Squaw Community Church, man, they're held to a certain standard, a Jesus standard. They, they, they're called to be committed. They're being raised out of the disciples. Look, that's, I'm afraid of that kind of stuff. They talking about they got, you got to pray, you know what I mean? And you got you to gotta actually read your Bible. You cra- Dude, I'm scared of that stuff. I got a fifth grade reading level. I don't know how to read it. Want me to read this? I got a King James Bible at home. I don't even know how to read thou shalt anything, right? Rebuketh and brethren and, and all this other stuff. What is that King James verse? That, that's, some people get afraid of that stuff. As a spectator, you would always become fearful of that which God is calling you to. I have to make that clear. The disciples, though, see, they were astonished. But the thing about a disciple, while they were astonished about what Jesus was saying and what he was doing, guess what they're still doing? They're still walking forward. Man, God, it looks like we're going to die in Jerusalem with this dude. But let's just keep on walking one step at a time. I want to give up because I'm astonished. I don't know what's going to happen. But, hey, man, I'm just going to do one every day, one foot, in front of the other, because I'm a disciple. See, a spectator, one who's following from the side, they're afraid of that, and I'm not doing all that. Because of that, I'm not committing myself. I'm not going to do that. Now they want to be accountable. Now they're going to call me and ask me specific questions because, you know what I mean, they ain't got nothing else better to do. God have mercy. We just want to be in somebody's life just for the fun of it. Yeah, like we don't have anything else better to do. You know what I mean? Then do that. Be busybodies in your life. I got enough things going on in my own life dealing with all these crazy leaders and stuff. You know what I mean? But it's like they, they want to ask me serious questions. How dare they? They want me to look like Jesus. Come on, man. Like Jesus? But listen to this. There's a difference between, <laughs> between following Jesus as a disciple and being spectators. 
who just look from the side in fear, like, I ain't ready for that. And this is how you know if you're respected. Y'all ready for this? Don't be leaving me bogus comments on my Facebook because I don't look at it anyways, but still, don't be doing that stuff. Y'all y'all want some of the, the attributes of a spectator, right? They avoid discipleship. They don't want no accountability. I don't want nobody in my life like that. I ain't telling nobody what's going on in my house. I don't care if my wife is beating me, right? I ain't doing none of that stuff, right? I ain't going to be committed. I don't want to be a member because if I, don't be, if I be a member, then I'm committed. I signed a contract. Now I feel, I feel compelled now and all this other stuff, you know what I mean? They say those things. Uh, you guys, read it for yourself and study it. These are attributes of a spectator because all of these things, in the end, you know what it is? It's fear. It is fear. All of it comes down to fear. And then some of it is a fear that is fueled by pride. I'm afraid of these things because really I have pride in my heart and I might punch the pastor. Right? I might burn that place down. Little old place in the corner. That's so look. Right? Then I'll go to this church off the street that's all made of all bricks. I can't burn that one down. Y'all better stop playing. And so listen, I just I'm just gonna let it go after this. I'm gonna ask this question. Y'all just grab your hearts and just give it to Jesus, okay? <laughs> this is the question. Not even part of the sermon. Are you a follower, a real disciple of Jesus, or are you just spectating? You don't have to answer that question. Holler at your spouse, kids, do what you got to do, okay? Listen, here it is. Giving up everything to come and follow Jesus is not without sufferings, as exampled in the previous text and described and insinuated by Jesus of leaving home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for Jesus and his gospel along with persecutions to inherit eternal life by grace through faith in the finished work of Jesus. It is a call and awareness of suffering. Now see, I can change those words and really like water it down and be like, you're going to have a blessed life. It's so amazing. But I'll be lying to you. My job is to equip you and to prepare you. And I want to tell you right now, there's going to be sufferings. There's going to be sufferings from people you thought would never be, they thought you thought were going to pat you on the back. And instead they're like, don't be bringing that Jesus over here. He coming at me with that G. I mean, I got invited to a wedding. And then they knew who or how I was and stuff like that. See me evangelizing, gang ministry, whole nine. They, they literally took the time, the bride, Took the time to text me and say, hey, listen, I'm about you. So exciting. Come out of wedding, whatever, blah, blah, blah. I just want to tell you one thing. You can't talk about Jesus. And I said, look, oh, you know, I said, listen, I just want to let you know that, man, I ain't going to your wedding. I can't talk about Jesus. I ain't going to your wedding. Because I know if I sit at that table, and guess what they're going to talk about? Kanye. Uh, what's his name, the basketball player that Jesse loves? LeBron James. They're going to talk about what, what happened in the club before that. They're going to talk about how much weed they were selling that week. Some of them are Jehovah Witnesses, and they're Jews, and they're going to talk about their Jewish stuff. And I can't say none of them. You're going to call all people. You're just going to call me or text me and tell me that? Why don't you tell your Jewish friends this? Catholic friends, Jehovah Witnesses. Why the Christian? So now you don't have a Christian at your wedding because I ain't go, Okay. They're not going to watch this stuff anyway, so I'm not even going to say that. So. But we got to stand on some stuff. Amen. Following Jesus. Listen. Following Jesus is being aware and knowing I'm going to suffer. I'm going to suffer. We need to understand and come to grips with this thing called suffering. But we also need to come to grips and accept if you're a believer. Right, any Christians in the house? If you're a believer, what is your reward in heaven? What is your reward even right now? If you're a believer and you confess Jesus your Lord and Savior, not just with your mouth, but if you believe it in your heart and you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, because only disciples go to heaven. You're the disciple of Jesus Christ, the follower of Jesus. What does the Bible say you inherit? Eternal life. And so following Jesus is choosing a mission and life of sufferings. But it also is a life of resurrection, a life of purpose, and eternal riches now and an eternity in heaven. Amen? Therefore, 
We must learn the hope that goes beyond the scope of sufferings through the actions that speak louder than words of our great Savior and suffering Messiah, who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Today I want to preach on three bullet points of three kind of hopes that we see in Jesus that we need to apply to our lives. Amen? And the first one is a resolute hope. A resolute hope. Amen? Somebody have hope in the house today? Anybody receiving anything so far? Hallelujah. Amen? I pray that today you leave this place filled with hope. The Bible says they were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. And the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. The definition of resolute is this. It is marked by firm determination. Come on. It is marked by bold steadiness. Synonymous with expressions such as do or die. You guys know what I'm talking about? There was a fighter in the UFC named, uh, oh, he's, he's the Arabic. They call him the Airbender, right? I forgot his name. Nobody knows his name in here? Israel Adesani. After his last fight, they asked him, how did you go through that? He had a brutal fight. He said, how did you go through that? He says, in my mind, I said, it's do or die. I'm willing to die inside this ring. And he ended up winning that fight. Some of us need to have a hope that goes beyond the scope. That we, are, we already have a resolute hope that gives us a determination and a firm boldness that is steady that says, listen, it is do or die for me. It is do or die. I'm either going to do it on this earth or I'm going to die and I'm going to be in heaven. But it is do or die for me. Some of us need to get to a resolute hope that we say within our hearts and we say within our minds, it is do or it is die. Whatever comes first, blessed be the name of the Lord. This was the mentality of Paul. He said, it is do or die. How do you get this mentality, Paul? Because I believe that be, to be absent from the body is to be present for the Lord. So I struggle with it too. I wish that I can continue to minister to you guys. Oh, but I wish that I can die and be with Jesus. Who talks like that? I tell you who. It is a resolute hope that is inside Christians that has a hope that goes beyond the scope of sufferings. It don't matter what you do to me. Throw me in a lion's den. Hallelujah, I'm going to see heaven. It sucks. I'm going to be eaten by some lions if they eat me. But if God chose that way for me to go, then praise the Lord. Because the last breath that I have on this earth is going to be the first breath that I have on streets of gold, walking with my King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in Jesus' name. It is a do or die mentality. Now, that don't mean you start going out there and acting crazy. Back in the dark age, they would have fights. Christians, true story, look up your history. In the dark age, they would have fights, sword fights, with other people because they wanted to get stabbed to death so they can be with Jesus. And so they went out there, started some fights, and got stabbed to death. I don't know if they went with Jesus or not because I don't know if that's like, what is that? <laughs> like suicide? Like I don't even know. Only God knows. But if I see one of those dudes in heaven, I hear about him, I definitely want to talk to that guy. What was going through your mind that day you died, <laughs> right? I would imagine they had a do or die mentality. And at that point, the dying part just became elevated than the do part. And it was like, I just want to be with Jesus. So I'm going to go out here and I'm going to stab and just be stabbed and go from there. A do or die mentality. Single-minded bent on or upon, bound, look at this one, and hell bent on or upon. It is related to such actions as, as, and, as consistent and steadfast, firm in belief, determination, or adherence, loyal. You see, Jesus had a resolute hope. He wasn't a crazy man. He wasn't a lunatic. He wasn't just like, like one of those dudes with the swords, like, I'm just going to get myself stabbed and die. No, he was a man that had a resolute hope that was so strong and firm inside of him that instead of leading from the back, going to the cross, he was the first one in line. Like, come on, y'all, we're going this way. Well, where we're going, we're going up to Jerusalem. Because in Jerusalem, 
the Son of Man is going to be handed over to the Gentiles, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and they're going to kill him. Think about somebody just telling you that. Hey, dude, we're going to the west side, to Inglewood. We're going to go preach the gospel. Listen, your pastor's going to die. They are going to kill me. Imagine that. We're having a meeting before evangelists, and I'm telling you guys, they're going to kill me in Inglewood. Okay, Pastor, and where we're going? We're going to Inglewood. What? But you're going to die in Inglewood. I know, but it's okay. Now, y'all come follow me. And the thing is, y'all just heard that I was going to die. Why in the world are y'all behind me if I'm going to die? I'm the one dying. Why are you back there? You, if you love me, you're going to be in front of me. No, they're behind me. They're behind Jesus. Jesus, I'm going to die, but I'm leading the way in front because everybody else is just like, what? You're, gonna, you're going to Jerusalem. You know you're going to die, and you're enthusiastic about it? You're so resolute about it? That you can't wait to get there? You're leading from the front? Who does that? I look at some of y'all and I remember some of y'all's story. Let's say like the, 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 the married couples. And if you had an issue in the house, you were not going there anytime soon. In that time, you're, you're like the Mr. Good Guy. Let's just talk about the husbands. Everybody cutting you in traffic. Go. Oh. I ain't in no rush at all. No, my wife found something in the drawer. Just keep going. Just everybody. If you're taking the bus, you're the last one off the bus. Driver, just keep driving. Take the long way. If you're in an Uber, and I'm going to get you home 10 minutes, sir, stop the car right now. Recollaborate your, uh, your map there. Long way, homie. We're going through your record drive. We're going to miss reception, everything. I ain't in nowhere. I ain't going nowhere fast right now. I don't got to be anywhere right now because you take the longest way home. Let you be a teenager and you know your mama, you know, got some, you got the report card and mama got in the crib. Listen, you're doing all of a sudden after school programs. Mom, I'm doing extra math today. Yeah, we're doing calculus. I need some help. I'm staying after school. It's going to be a long night for me, right? You're doing gym, knowing it's the first time the whole school year you even went into the gym room. Ever, ever any excuse not to go home. Why? Because suffering is waiting for you there. And if you had anybody like my mama, she had an extension cord waiting for me. It was like different things. I'm like, I'm not going home. Dude, I'm just going to look. I'm hopping fences just for nothing. Just to hopefully I hurt myself. She'll have mercy on me. It was like the last thing that I wanted to be in. The last thing I want to do was go home. Here is Jesus, knowing he's going to die, and he's leading from the front. How did he do it? What was inside of him? It was a resolute hope. Because he had a hope that, we, uh, that went beyond the scope of sufferings. I hope you guys don't miss this today. Our very own Lord and Savior, our teacher, the Son of God, on the front lines towards his own death. The disciples knew what they faced at Jerusalem, and they were astonished with those who were following on the sidelines, spectating the life of Jesus, who were afraid. Jesus also knew what awaited him at Jerusalem, and yet he was leading the caravan of people, including his disciples, on the way up to Jerusalem. Could you imagine some husbands today that just stand up and end up getting a resolute hope that says, listen, I don't care what's going on. I don't care what we've been doing in the house. From this day forward, we are following Jesus Christ with a firm determination. I don't care what you say. You say we're going this way toward the cross. Could you imagine that? Could you imagine wives start standing up and they stop teeter-tottering on the fence of the world and Christ, Facebook and Instagram and all this other stuff or whatever. And they make a stand and say, listen, husband, slacker. We are going to church. We are following Jesus. Hey, but I'm tired. You ain't tired no more. Get your butt up right now. We're going to church right now. Could you imagine the kids who were up all night and they try to make an excuse like that? And all of a sudden it's like, listen, you're going to be tired today, but you're going to be in church tired. Let's go. We're out of here. You're bad for not waking up on time, but my hair, okay. We can cut it off right now. It's the only time we got or we can leave. What you want to do? Okay, fine. We're out of here. Could you imagine we have a resolute hope? There's no stopping a resolute person. We're doing it with a do or die mentality. We are all in. Amen? It is the kind of hope that God wants us to receive. 
think about it. When we're in those situations, it's the last thing we want to do is to finally have to deal with that situation. We'll do everything else other than that. Yet Jesus was not only leading the way on the front lines, he also had a resolute and steadfast hope in the face of sufferings because for him, the sufferings he drew closer to was already firmly determined by his steadfastness or firm belief, determination and adherence to the loyalty of the Father that his death will actually bring about life through his sufferings in which he was purposed and had resolved within his mind. Want to know what kept him on the front lines going closer and closer to the cross? He looked beyond the cross. He had a scope that went beyond the very cross that he's seen the resurrection and he's seen all of us who will be saved by his actions. And you know what that did for him? It allowed him to die to himself even before he went to that cross. It allowed him to have a resolute hope because he thought beyond the scope of sufferings. And he was able to continue to go forward. Look what the Bible says right here. Luke 9.51, it says this, Now when the time was approaching for him to be taken up to heaven, he was determined to go to Jerusalem to fulfill his purpose. I want to let us know that Jerusalem is symbolic for a place of suffering and death and persecution. When he said we're going to Jerusalem, he might as well have told him, we're going to go suffer, we're going to go be persecuted, and we're going to go die. Because that's what Jerusalem represented. And so here it is. He had a determination, according to Luke, when he was on his way to Jerusalem, which is the definition of a resolute hope. When we know our purpose in suffering, we are able to have a resolute hope in fulfilling it with determination and hell bent on or upon going through sufferings no matter what we have to face. No matter what, we'll be going through it. The question is, is do you know your purpose? According to Peter, our purpose is to suffer. And that suffering is not without ref refining. It's not without God cleansing us. It is through sufferings that our Lord and Savior was made perfect, according to Hebrews. So it will be through sufferings that God would make us perfect. Christians who are examples of Jesus Christ, not only on the mountain highs, but oh, even more in the valley lows of sufferings. And so Jesus knew the grace of God because he was and is the grace of God in bodily form. When we know the grace of God and his sufficiency to get us through sufferings and weaknesses, we can have a, a resolute hope that Jesus, or just like Jesus, who has already led the way in sufferings and is able to lead the way for us as we suffer as an example by his sufferings, knowing we are called to suffer at the cross of Jesus in order to experience true resurrection power of Jesus. Some of us forget that before resurrection, it comes the cross. Before you get a new life, you have to go through the cross of suffering. Jesus Christ, this is the encouragement to have a resolute hope. He already led it by example. He already gave us the perfect example of what happens after one suffers. There's glory. There's resurrection. There's power. It is for us to put our eyes upon that rather than to keep our eyes upon the sufferings. See, some of us go through sufferings, and literally we can't even see past those sufferings. They become like this rather than like this and able to see around it. So when we go through sufferings, it's always like this. We don't see anything beyond the sufferings. And you know what happens to a man or woman like that? They start making impulsive decisions. They start making decisions based upon feelings rather than based upon realities and facts of Christ Jesus. Because we're like this. We have to get to a point that we become just like Jesus as he's our example of one who goes through suffering. We have to have a resolute hope and choose to have a resolute hope that is determined. It is for that reason that when we end up leading people to Jesus Christ, one of the first things we try to do is let them know what's going to happen. Hey, you got saved. Man, yes, man, I'm so excited. Book is all over the place, crying and stuff like that. Dude, I'm so happy for you, man. I'm proud of you. You took the step forward. But now I want to let you know that all of hell is now against you. What do you mean, Pastor? I never heard of that stuff. I thought you just do a prayer and you're good and everybody else is going to like you. No. All of hell is now against you. Why is that? Because you're not on his team no more. 
You're not on his team no more. You are not on his team anymore. The moment you become a Christian, all of hell, listen to me, all of hell comes against you. You know why? Because the devil is afraid that if I don't, if I let this dude go for even a short time and he ends up getting or she ends up getting a resolute hope, that person is unstoppable. You guys ever seen somebody that has a resolute hope? They're unstoppable. In fact, when you go back to the Tower of Babel, we talked about this before. These were a people that had a resolute hope that they said, let's build this tower up into heaven. And they all came together and they were unstoppable to such a degree that God had to look down. And he says, if we don't go down there, nothing will be impossible for those people. And guess what he did? He made Puerto Ricans, Mexicans, all time. He gave everybody a different language. So then now I'm looking at you. I speak Spanish now. I no longer speak our same language. You're speaking whatever you speak. And it went down the line on that day. And guess what they did? Everybody went their own direction. It's exactly what happened on the Tower of Babel. But what happened with them? They had a resolute hope. And they made a firm determination. We are going to build this thing until we reach to heaven. What was their motive? To be God. Could you imagine if we took that for the Christ side of it and have a resolute hope? I would see all y'all every single Sunday. It would be like my wife. I was like practically trying to force my wife to stay home today because she had a, a, a back injury. Something happened with her back, right? And I'm like, baby, just stay home. It was even to the point I was frustrated. Girl, oh, and she felt kind of like the attitude. And I had to repent so many times this morning. But I'm like, baby, just stay home. Like, I'm carrying her. My back's hurting. I'm going to carry a whole other person now, having Lana try to help out or whatever. And he's like, you could have just stood home, made it to church late. I'm like, come on, bro. But she had a resolute hope that was like, no, I have to go to church. Even if I need two people to carry me in there, I could not stop this girl. I could unless I said I'm, I'm not going to church either. And she probably might have stood or she might have rebuked me and just left me there by myself and then left without me. You know what I mean? But it's a resolute hope that I was like, no, I need to be in church. A couple of weeks ago, we had a drag uh, uh, deacon Chris in the house. And I'm looking at him like, dude, do you understand that we have to pick you up now? I was mad over that. But I, I missed the fact of he had a resolute hope that was like, I'm going to be in church. Even though I got to lay in the back, put my legs up, I'm going to be in church. That is a resolute hope. You can, I couldn't tell nothing to Chris or Carmen because they just looking at me like, I got to be in church. You can't, what do you tell a person that has a resolute like that? You can't tell them, no, okay, yes, fine. We're going to jump on my back, horsey back ride. Let's go. And it's just like, you can't do nothing. You cannot tell that person nothing. Now, this is the problem. In our society, we don't have people with a resolute hope. We have people with a resolute pride. You can't tell them nothing. They don't want to hear nothing. They don't care how many times you point out in this Bible, you got to be a disciple, bro, or sis, or whatever. I don't care. They won't say I don't care. It's like, I ain't got time for that. I ain't got time for that. Right? Bro, you should be in church. You should be accountable. No, I don't need that stuff. They have a resolute pride. I don't care how long you've been serving God. I don't care how many cartwheels you can do. I don't care how many whatever you think you did in your life. The Bible remains the same. Be disciples. Teach them to obey all that I've commanded you, and I will be with you to the end of the age. It doesn't say anything less or anything more than that. Read your Bibles. Outside of that, is this a resolute pride? That's what it is. And I love to be the one to tell you that. <laughs> this, is sad. this is like just telling the truth right there. Listen to this, all right? Look at what the psalmist says here. Psalm 51.10. Create in me, this should be our prayer for an absolute or resolute hope. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right and steadfast spirit within me. Steadfast is synonymous for resolute. And see, the thing is, we're not going to start off with a resolute hope. Can we just be honest in church today? Well, you're not going to start out getting saved all of a sudden. Yes, I got a hope that just, that, that's it. I'm ready to die and everything. It's not going to happen like that. But you know what can happen? Your prayer life can change. So add to your prayer life after you pray for all your food, 
and that's the only prayer you're probably doing, add to your prayer life, God created me a clean heart. You know what keeps us from having a resolute hope? An impure heart. Okay? Oh, God, and renew a right and steadfast spirit within me. That is a spirit that is determined, bold, steady, do or die, single-minded, bent on or upon, bound, hell-bent. That's the kind of spirit the psalmist was praying for. And listen, that's okay. That is okay. God is not expecting us that overnight we all of a sudden have a resolute hope. What he is expecting is that we pray for a heart like that and then let him do that inside of us. And as he gives the opportunity to do it, we say yes, and we say amen, and we go do it. How does that look like for the, uh, the upcoming weeks, the rest of this month? Can I tell you guys? You might just have to start off very small, and just, but this may be very huge for some of y'all. Just come to church every Sunday for the rest of this month. To say, okay, God, I'm not going to start. I know, God, you call me to do X, Y, and Z. Right now, they just look so far from me. But what I can do right now, God, listen, I'm going to start right where I'm at, God, and I pray that you will take me where I need to be. God, can you help me to be in church every single Sunday for the rest of this month? But that doesn't mean that then you make a resolution in your mind that, and after them 30 days, homie, I'm calling off. I'm going right back to where I was. No. But start off with something small. I'm going to read the Bible every single day. I'm going to pray every single day, not just for my food or my spouse. I'm going to pray for other things like a good heart. Amen? This is a resolute hope. He wanted a spirit that made his heart unwavering and steadfast or determined and loyal to God despite sufferings. God wants us to have a resolute hope that goes beyond the scope of sufferings and overcomes our astonishments and fears as we realize he has already gone before me and therefore has made the way for me through his sufferings to perfect me as, he, as it perfected him, according to Hebrews. Here it is. But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death so that by the grace of God he might taste death, death for everyone. And bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting. Look at God's perspective. It is fitting. It was fitting that God, talking about God the Father, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer, talking about Jesus, of their salvation perfect through, what is it? Through what he suffered. God is trying to perfect us. Some of us are even praying, God, I want to be committed. I want to be consistent, God. I want to be all that you call me to be. And God is like, okay, listen, you're going to go through some sufferings. So now we may accept that. Okay, God, fine. I understand. The word of God says I am made to suffer. God, can you please let me know right now what are going to be some of the things that I'm going to suffer for? And it may be this, talking to spouses out there. It may be that you may be the only one coming to church every Sunday. Because your spouse is slacking and he needs more prayer or she needs more prayer. That's okay. It may be that your children, you know what I mean, are acting crazy. Then they got to stay home. Whatever it is. It may be the fact of like we're talking about coming to church and being dedicated to that. Whatever it is. The point is this. God wants to do something through sufferings. I don't know all the answers for that. But I know who does. His name is Jesus. Ask him, God, what are the purpose of this sufferings right here? James says, if you're going through sufferings, what does he say to ask for? Wisdom. Wisdom. Wisdom is the application of knowledge. Knowledge of what? Knowledge of the word. God, give me wisdom so I can apply this in my life intentionally, daily, and specifically. Amen? This brings us to our second point of action in Jesus. Providence, hope. Providence, hope. It is defined as divine guidance or care. This is some powerful stuff right here, guys. Many of us don't have hope because we fail to realize that God is our divine guidance or care. God conceived as the power sustaining and guiding human destiny. What did Jesus say in 32b? He said this. Look at what he tells the disciples, right? Again, he took to 12 disciples aside, or 12 aside, and he told them what was going to happen, right? 
what was going to happen. What is he trying to tell us when it comes down to hope and sufferings? God is trying to be the divine guidance or care. God conceived as the power sustaining and guiding human destiny. Here he is. Jesus Christ comes. He knows where he's going. He's leading the way. He stops now to gather his 12 disciples, pulls them aside, and he begins to tell them what's going to happen. You know what that is? providential care it is providence hope it is God guiding and caring for his people to let them know what is about to happen in Jerusalem why is that so they can have hope if Jesus already knew what was going to happen then he already knew why he was taking those steps and leading his people forward he already knew it and because he already knew it he was able to have a providence hope He knew the scriptures. He knew the prophecies that he was about to fulfill. He knew it all together. And that's why he had a providence hope. And you might say, well, but he was 100% God and he knew all things. But this is the thing, right? He doesn't know what I'm going through. Yes, he does. Well, I don't know what I'm about to go through. Yes, you do. You know why? Because we have the whole Bible that goes all the way to Revelation. That it gives us the prophet, it gives us a guidance It gives us and reminds us of God's care. It reminds us that we have the power of God that sustains us and guides us through human destiny. So that lets us know that we can have a providence hope. It is a hope that is dependent upon God's guidance, God's care, God's power, and God's sustenance. That is providence hope. Jesus took the disciples aside and he began to tell them what was going to happen. Psalm 41.9 is Jesus' betrayal. Psalm 22, 16 through 18, and Isaiah 53, 4 through 5 was his crucifixion. Psalm 16.10 was his resurrection. Jesus knew he was going to be betrayed. He knew he was going to be crucified. And you know what gave him the hope to continue on going? Because he knew he was going to resurrect. Could you imagine if you truly put your hope in Jesus Christ... And you know that there is death, be, or there is life beyond the grave. How much hope you would begin to have on a day-to-day basis? If you knew and believed that God works out all things for the good, especially those who love Him when are called according to His purpose, that He works it all for the good, that you can have a hope that goes beyond the scope of sufferings. If you stood on the promises of God, Genesis fifty verse twenty, that was the scripture I held on to when I was locked up, waiting for God's deliverance going through the sufferings of of not being free, not having a refrigerator to go to, not having salt and pepper whenever I wanted to, ketchup, if anybody knows me, cereal, come on somebody, right? I would trade three days of food for some cereal. And what carried me was this, what the devil meant for evil. Oh, God turned it for good to the saving of many lives. Genesis 50, verse 20. I want you guys to take a a moment, just look around, right? Right? Uh, Genesis 50 verse 20, right? What God, what the devil meant for evil, God turned for the good to the saving of many lives. You look around, right? And God birthed this, this ministry in our living room. Now look around and see who has God saved through this ministry. What the devil meant for evil, God turned it around for the saving of many lives. Why don't you give up, Pastor? Why don't y'all keep going? What makes it keep going? Because we have a providence hope that my God is divine. He's divine, number one, guiding and caring for us. He's given us the power to sustain us and to guide us to be servant leaders, to lay down our lives so that you guys can live. That's providence hope. But what am I trying to say? We're missing such a hope within our lives. And it's called providence. And it's knowing that God is with us. It's knowing that even though it hurts, my God can take spoils and make greatness out of it. My God can grab nothing and make dirt. And then he can have dirt, the thing that we stepped on, and make human beings, complex creatures with a DNA structure that they're still trying to read today. Trillions upon trillions. Excuse me, trillions of data. 
And he made us, you and me, not from monkeys. Let's just put that out there real fast. He made us from dirt. He grabbed the lowest form of our earth, and he made you and me. But listen to this. We're missing God in our lives because we're forgetting who God is. If we can just grab a hold of providence hope, sufferings will be completely different. We would embrace them. We will walk toward them. We wouldn't want from them. We wouldn't be afraid of them. Storms, when they come, we will look at them completely different. It will be like, man, if the devil's coming at me today, it's because God is trying to do something amazing today in my life. If he's trying to attack my family, it's because God is allowing him to because he wants my family to grow and to become stronger in him. If, if I won't go through anything of suffering, we know that God is doing something amazing because we have providence, hope. And so today, listen, whatever you're going through, Whatever heartache, whatever heartbreak, whatever doubt you have, whatever sufferings you're going through, put it under providence hope. And say, God, if you allow this in my life, you have a purpose to allow the same thing to bless me and to save other lives through me in Jesus' name. That is the hope that we have. Can I end this? 2 Corinthians 4, 7 on down says this. But if we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that, the, that this all-surpassing power is from God. It is his guidance, his care, his power, his sustenance. All-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side. Anybody feeling that today? We're crushed but not perplexed. Or but not in despair. Persecuted but not abandoned. We may feel like we're struck down, but we're not destroyed. We're always carrying around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. Come on, somebody. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then... Look at the hope that goes beyond the scope of suffering. So then, death is at work in us. Oh, but life is at work in you. We may be going through sufferings, but God has a purpose in those sufferings, and it's to, it's to save lives and put life in other people to remind us of the life that God has put inside us. It's amazing when somebody comes to church that you invited. How many people know what I'm talking about? There's like a fulfilling there, right? It was Jonathan who invited Lumon. And I'm sure as Lamont continues to grow, Jonathan's going to look back and I'm like, God, thank you that you were able to use me to invite Lamont to church. Why is that? While Jonathan is experiencing the death of dying to self in sin, life is being produced in Lamont that reminds Jonathan of the very life that is inside of him, even though he's experiencing death on the outside. He can be reminded of the life that's on the inside in Christ Jesus. And so listen, I'm going to close this right here. Jesus had hope beyond the scope of sufferings. He knew he was going to face and undergo because Jesus had providential or divine guidance or care and God, the Holy Spirit within him to sustain and guide his destiny in accordance with the word of God. All this he was going to face he knew he was going to face it because the word of God said so. And he was the word of God made flesh. He knows the end from the beginning because he is the alpha and omega or the beginning and the end. He was trying to inform his disciples of that which they did not know what was going to happen, but was with the one who is providential and knows all things and all means and provides such for them. Did you guys catch that? How do we go through the sufferings under providence or hope? We go through it knowing that God knows all things and provides all means. And he is able to work out all things. So therefore, it's not about us having all the whys answered and all the questions that we have in our head, giving answers in black and white. It's about us submitting to the one who is the answer. Jesus the Christ. Submitting to the fact that he knows all things. God was teaching them about providential hope 
that they will need when they go through hardships, difficulties, shipwrecks, perplexities, unfriendings, death, and overall sufferings, that they can have hope that comes from the providence of God who guides and cares for them and empowers and sustains them.